We're with well-known actor Jonathan Frid, who was renowned for his role in Dark Shadows. Jonathan, I guess the question I have for you is why has Dark Shadows continued to be such a treat with most audiences today? Well, I, I seem to think that, that should, the, the fans should be asked that question rather than myself. Um, I, I never quite understood it to begin with, mm -hmm. its success, and uh, let alone its uh, revival. Um, I guess that, uh, well, there's a new generation, of course, but I think there's um, something legendary about it now. It's almost become part of American folklore, or at least it sort of a, has a cult following. Well, your role started, what, around 1967? Yes, April 67. And I did the show on a year before mm -hmm. I came into it. And a lot of changes have occurred. Uh, we had, well, I think if I remember correctly, it was Victoria Winters, a governess goes to, it's kind of like a gothic it, yeah. romance, mm -hmm. and then it shifted. Well, yes, I, I guess it, it, it was always a gothic story from the beginning, uh, except that I think Curtis wanted to give it a little bit more pizzazz uh, with a monster. Uh, and it, they'd already had ghosts and things like that, but he apparently wanted to go for a monster. <clears throat> and, um, but however, the, 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 some of the writers, one in particular, who I think really was responsible for getting me cast, I only came to this conclusion about two years ago, many, many, all these years after it happened. He, and, he was going to uh, Yale at the same time as I was. He was a playwriting student, mm -hmm. and he'd worked uh, with me in shows. I was a directing student, and we were all acting in these plays up there. And I was always known for the, the heavies that I always played, and I'd always make the, whatever evil I did, I always try to, just for the sake of making the character interesting and always a surprise, uh, I would work for other values in a character, to picking two poles. And anyway, I think that was when it came to Dark Shadows and they were casting Barnabas. Uh, I came to his mind, I think that's how it happened. And he said, Frid would be good for this role because he knows how to develop it into more than just a monster. Apparently, I guess Curtis really was thinking of just getting a, a monster uh -huh. on the show. And it was the writers who thought, well, to keep a monster interesting, uh, we have to give show more facets to his character than just his aggressiveness. And so, indeed, Barnabas turned out to be a very vulnerable person, as well as being aggressive. He was in love. He was, he was always part of a triangle, being rejected by one, going after the other. And, you know, it was a vicious circle. He brought a tremendous amount of humanity to a role that would mostly be a thankless role. Well, exactly. And uh, I mean, I always do this with any role. Uh, I always pick two poles so that I can dance in between. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a frustrated Fred Astaire. I don't know, but I mean, I like to. I like to, I think that's the best way I can describe it, is if you can pick two poles of the character, you've got all this space in between to, to dance in. Yeah, here you have, you have a classical background in, in mm -hmm. theater, mm -hmm. and you go and play a vampire. Well, there are a lot of classic characteristics uh, to this kind of a show. Uh, I mean, it had all the, and the superficiality, at least, of a classic kind of play. I mean, convoluted sentences and convoluted uh, speeches that I'd have to make. And they always felt that the vampire could, uh, could get around all of the, the, these, compl <laughs> these co complex sentences that I'd have to say. But, uh, no, I think a certain classic background helps to, uh, to make you a, a little bit larger than life. And after all, a vampire is a bit larger than life. Uh, but and, and on the other hand, too, it was not a come down by any means because um, the only thing I didn't like about about the vampire was was the actual biting. Only it was simply because it was done so badly <laughs> and it was directed so badly. Uh, but you had the little bats thing. floating around too. Well, yeah, but you know, but all of the, the, the gnashing of the teeth and everything was so uh, clumsy and obvious. But um, unfortunately, I only did that biting business for about three minutes of the whole five to four years I was on the show. But the character itself became quite complex indeed. And in some mm -hmm. shows, some days, the, the script was very, very good. Some days it was excellent. And other days it was perfectly dreadful. And uh, for my money, uh, off, too often it was perfectly could you, dreadful. Could you tell us a little bit about the shooting schedule of a, a program like that? How would you work on that? <laughs> well, of course, now that's going way back some. Uh, this is n not the way they do soaps now, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, now they're hour soaps a day. But in those days, they were just half hour. 
and uh, we did it like a play. Uh, did you have time to learn your lines beforehand? Or, or did you <laughs> not, just walk not really. through? Not really. I mean, you learn to find where the teleprompters are as much as you learn the lines. At least that's the way I did it. But um, it, was a, it was a fairly tight schedule uh, for a half-hour show. And Dark Shadows, of course, was more difficult than other soaps because of all these magical effects. So we had to go and to use chroma key. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to explain that to your audience, you do it no. because I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> but anyway, chroma key means very uh, special uh, technical effects, which meant that the actors suffered rehearsal time yeah. to get these effects. So we were additionally burdened by the fact that we were sometimes cheated out of our run-throughs by all this time taken on. Oh, just but anyway, it was all done in a day. When I, when I think of it, you know, when we finished taping about four in the afternoon, we'd have a half hour break, then we'd go up and, and look at the next day's script. And I used to think, this piece of paper that we're looking at now is going to be produced, a totally produced production, this time tomorrow. And it would just devastate. So you were basically day. working, what, five or six days a week with this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and five days a week. Five days a week. And, and, uh, and for a while, not all the time, the average lead at a soap does about three and a half a week. Mm -hmm. out of the five uh, and that was my average over the years but for a while there I was on every day it's very training for about a month or so I was on every day and practically every scene every day oh and, my god uh, really became quite and I said to Curtis I said you've got to get somebody else in the show and he said you're kidding and I said no I, I, you're overworking me and I can't I don't like all this work and he said well okay and so they tried this person and that person and along came David Selby mm -hmm. and, as Quentin and, and he <laughs> gave me a run for my money and, and I thought, well, I asked for it, and so you got it. He, I got it, and but it was on the whole, it was a great relief. And so uh, he would be overworked for a while, and it gave me a break, and back and forth. And that. Let me ask you this: as an actor, do you find that doing a role that's so powerful in the terms of the public consciousness, something that they see on a continuous basis, does that typecast you? I know Adam West, who did Batman, had the same problem. With that getting work afterwards, that well, a problem. You know, it, it only it only gets typecast in terms of the media. Mm -hmm. It's what the, it's how they deal with it and how you want to deal with them. And I used to get frustrated by it, but uh, when all said and done, I no, I enjoyed doing Barnabas. Barnabas was a was the least typed person in the whole show. I know we're, what I mean? we're, we're talking we're, about we're the show. We're talking semantics now, yeah. and I don't I don't agree with what most people consider typecasting, mm -hmm. because Barnabas was the least type person. He was everything. He was he was the universe. He was a jack of all trades. He was, <laughs> but I mean he had he, he had more emotional. He had more, he had more uh, more possibilities to he had more of a range in his role than any of the others, by far. Except that you see, but the, but the way he sold Barnabas mm -hmm. was by his fangs. So. Everybody in the world that never really saw the show or, or, or really thought very much about it uh, went right along with the press saying, oh yeah, he's the, fa he's the guy with the fangs, he's the, he's the vampire in the show. I never played vampire. I, I don't even know what a vampire is and I'm not interested in being in a, in a vampire. I never was during the show. What I was playing, if you want to say one thing he played a lot in that show, was the lie. He was a liar. I mean, that was his evil, not being a vampire so much. Well, I guess he was evil because he used to do women in all the time. But, but I mean, uh, you never really saw that. But what you saw him do all the time was lying. But, of course, we made that, that he had to. I mean, he, he had no other course but to lie. So the, the lying became his vulnerability and therefore became a, almost uh, made him sympathetic, whereas most people, when they tell lies, you want to put them in jail. But mm -hmm. he didn't want to do that with Barnabas. I know this was an interesting show in that it got so much national press, unlike most of the soaps at the time. Plus, it was different. It wasn't the uh, General Hospital or the Days of Our Lives. It had, it obviously, ha it had a mystery to it. It had a horrific effect to it, but it was unique for its time. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, and of course, that's what made its life so short uh, for a soap. Because yeah. um, my co-producer of, of my one-man show, Mary O'Leary. Mm -hmm. um, she works with Guiding Light. It's been going on for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So five, six years for heaven's sakes is a very short time for soap. But however, uh, this was a special soap in the sense that we did about, we did all the classic gothic stories. It's like only, an extended very few. miniseries. There are actually. very few. There's only about uh, what 15 to 20 basic gothic stories, mm -hmm. and we did them sometimes two or three times over. And after two or three times. You know, the it, it, seem, it seems like you went through the entire encyclopedia of witchcraft and demonology yeah, at sure, some point. Uh, sure, but, but, but you can get all that done five days a week for five years. 
Mm. See, that's easy to, easy to cover all that what, material. What brought the, the show to a close? Well, just that. I mean, I think it got, it got repetitive. I mean, people, people started people started to stop, stop watching. Now, there are some people who say, uh, oh, I, we watched right till the end. And there are some pe people who used to tell me that, and I'd corner them a little bit. And I said, well, no, wait a minute. Now, did you watch? Well, no, not every day. Um, somebody I did ask this once, and they, uh, when I was first on the show, it was in second, about the, about the time of the end of the first year, and they literally wouldn't do. They'd, they they would stop everything to see every episode. But three years later, I was talking to that person again, and well, I couldn't watch it every day this week. I watched two days, but the mother had me do something, or I had to do something. And, and uh, so you saw a change the first, in the market. The first year, uh, the hell with mother, uh -huh. you, 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 did, you saw the show no matter what. But uh, you had uh, suddenly responsibilities. That's why the show went off the air, because people were not addicted anymore. They just sort of saw it casually. It was addiction that kept that. And you had a grand finale. You get cured. Everything seems all right with the world, with a little bit of mystery at the end. Then you go and do a motion picture. Hmm? You did the motion picture. There's actually two. Well, right? yes, but they, they were done during the during shooting. the actual shooting. Yeah, yeah, that's why it was able to be done. By the way, that was when uh, when um, uh, David Selby uh, oh. as Quentin became very popular, and so he took he kept the show going. The soap. Uh, we went up to uh, ah. to because um, the films have become cult film. classics. Actually, particularly House of Dark Shadows. Yeah. Uh, See how the vampires do it was the tagline. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't too enamored myself of the, of the picture. Um, now, you, you got involved with your own one-man show. You set up Clunes Associates. Mm -hmm. What well, is Clunes well, Associates? Well, of course, that's, no, that, we really are jumping. Well, that, that's something we've, uh, that uh, Mario Leary and I formed about two years ago mm -hmm. um, to further uh, the ends of my one-man show concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mary is general manager, and she does all the booking and, uh, and does all of the... <laughs> All the nitty gritty hard work, mm -hmm. and I just I'm just the artiste. <laughs> uh, although she does a, a lecture herself, by the way, a mm -hmm. very good one too. It was probably more effective than mine because she gets right down to the nitty gritty and tells students how to get jobs and what they have to do to get into. Because she works on Guiding Light and works with actors and producers and directors. She's associated with them. Mm -hmm. And um, but anyway, we we formed this company to to, to do these shows and. Uh, uh, it all came out of the Dark Shadows festivals when I got tired of, of uh, answering questions about Dark Shadows every, every time I went to these festivals. And I said, well, give me a break here. Let me do something else. So I'll read some stories. And the fans, in fact, were, were delighted Fools and, and very encouraging. So I started to do these readings of stories and, and poetry and so forth. A lot of, at one time, I did a whole show. The first part was the roles that I played in the past that might have influenced me in my playing of Barnabas. Mm -hmm. And then the second part was, was material written by fans that was inspired by the show. And indeed, some of it was excellent. I mean, you could fill this whole studio with, with literature. You could make a library out of this room of literature written by fans about Dark Shadows. It was incredible. And a lot of it was very good. And, and indeed, I did a whole show. But however, then I, that's when I got the, the, the idea of doing a professional show, I mean, beyond Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I had to make it more universal. And that's, that's what I'm doing. And now I, I've got the reason I'm, I'm interested, plans. I remember when I was much younger, picking up the album that was put out with the score by Robert Cobert. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and David Selby had yes, done indeed. voiceovers. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me a little bit mm -hmm. of your current presentation. And I, I remember yeah. actually having those things, taking this, the, uh, got the transcript from it, and we were using it in our drama classes mm -hmm. when I was younger. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. I love the only recording I've ever made. You put these earphones on them, and you hear, you, hear you sound like God himself. I mean, it's, it's, they're so exaggerated. Your voice has become so enlarged and booming, and you get very carried away with it. It was fun doing that. What happened to you after Dark Shadows was concluded? Well, I just sort of disappeared uh, publicly mm -hmm. and had a ball and lived, uh, tried to live a normal life. And in fact, it wasn't that difficult. Um, uh, and I went off to, well, I did some work. I went, I went to Texas and did dinner theater there, did Wait Until Dark. And then I did a picture uh, in Hollywood, uh, ABC movie of the week with Shelley Winters, The, the Devil's Daughter. Mm -hmm. And then I was in Oliver Stone's very first picture. 
Oh, really? Um, up in Quebec called Seizure. I think he doesn't like to talk very much about it. <laughs> and uh, s very similar to Dan Curtis, he doesn't like very much talking about Dark Shadows either. And there was a very similar, a great similarity between Dan Curtis and Oliver Stone. For one, they're the two top, I guess, the two top hot directors in New York and in Hollywood right now. Dan Curtis with a sequel to Winds of War, which is War is something of remembrance. Winds of War. Winds of War, and then something of remembrance that he's doing uh, now, which is War and remembrance. remembrance. War of Remembrance, which will be the most it's a col million. colossal, expensive yeah. show business things that ever in history. Well, he went on and did the Night Stalker series, right? And several but others. where they uh, where they share something in common, not only is he uh, very big, but Oliver Stone's is au courant right now, and uh, and very popular, and they both started very in a very similar sort of way, both. That was the, their star in both their first pictures. Uh -huh. uh, as with Oliver Stone, as with Dan Curtis, they both had good cinematographers, and they were both beginning, and as beginning directors, a good, having a good cinematographer saves the day a lot. These cinematographers who kept saying to these guys, you can't do that shot at 7 o'clock at night. You, you've lost your son. You, you know, you've got to get your light. You, this. And no, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. And they both were very stubborn. And they say, but I'm going to get it. And they go at these things. And, uh, but they were very similar, uh, Oliver Stone and Dan Curtis. They were both tough birds and, um, and, and, and would just do anything. They were, they were slave drivers. And, uh, but they had, they had that same thing in common. They, had, they were trying to do the impossible. And, uh, and they didn't always, weren't always able to put it up. Both their first pictures, they were both on tight budgets. And so they had very little to play with in their editing. Uh -huh. I mean, they didn't have time to take 50 takes. They only took two or three takes, if that, for some scenes. Some scenes were not even, were even less time on that. So it was a very, it's interesting for me to look back on Oliver Stone and Dan Curtis as, as being very, you, you've very really similar. known or worked with a lot of very famous people, people that have... Well, I've touched base yeah. with some people. You don't really get to know them all that well. I mean, you, you work with them, like Catherine Hepburn, uh, although I did see a lot of her because I was with her for almost a year up at Stratford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then we went on the road with one of those productions for six months, so it was almost a, really almost a year. And uh, although we never saw very much of her in a social way, but we did occasionally at parties. And she always, of course, came into a room and she radiated. She was probably the, uh, of all the stars I've ever worked with, she's the most magnetic in that sense. Um, I mean, if she'd go to a party, she'd just come in the room and, I mean, no, others wouldn't have that same effect. You know, you know, the one thing we haven't really touched on, and I'm really jumping backwards here, mm -hmm. is your own start in theater and acting. What got you started? What was your motivation? And where did you go with it? Well, I, I, I suppose it goes right back to when you were an infant. And uh, I can remember well, at the age of three, wanting to, to be a minister. And uh, I was brought up as a Presbyterian. And there's not very much inspiration in a Presbyterian service for an actor, but that's all I knew. And I remember when I used to go with my grandmother in this little Ontario town, uh, twice a day, church twice, and Sunday school once. And um, and I guess I used to come home and get uh, and get on her staircase and pretend that was a, a church an altar, mm -hmm. but I was very cruel because I made my cousins, uh, the congregation, while I spouted away at them, and I, to do that I made them sit backwards on the stairs so that their fannies were in the step below and their feet were in the step above, you know, hanging on desperately. I made them do that. Well, I preached at them. So uh, I wasn't a very kind uh, <laughs> minister of the church. I was a very cruel one and made them all sit that way. And, um, but anyway, uh, I used to, and then she, my grandmother had an old uh, organ, one of those you know, funny old organs with a pump. You pedaled your way and you pulled the stops up. And I used to play it with one finger and so forth. So I was my own organist. And I used to, and I used to get myself in robes. And that was my first acting job. Uh, and then the first time I was ever nervous at acting was simply getting up on the aisle in school and having to recite a poem in class. And I would shake with shiver, with fear. Uh, and then I finally got over that and, and, and I got the reading prize at school. 
when you run out, and it was the best. Did you take professional theater courses? Oh, college, yeah. or? I think I'm the most overly educated actor. I, 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 mean, I don't say that proudly. I think. You, almost, well, you mentioned. I was, yeah. I'm too educated. I was just. I mean, I was just. I was an escapist, is what I was. I mean, I escaped in the schools more than I really needed them. I think. But oh, you know, I went to Yale. I went to the Royal Academy in London. Oh, that's all paid off. I think. Sure. There's no question about it. I mean, I've learned at the Royal Academy. I, I was there, then I quit after two terms, like I was re young and restless, and I wanted to get out in the real world, so to speak. And the real world turned out to be a little tacky little repertory company out in Cornwall run by students from the Royal Academy. Mm -hmm. So you know, I was just of my own kind. Where do you call home today? New York. I'm still a Canadian citizen, but... Uh, but you have a lot of famous actors from Canada. Yes. Donald Sutherland, Christopher yes. Plummer. Yes, yes. Uh, Oh, yes, who else? Norma Shearer in her day. Mm -hmm. um, um, who was the guy that used to work with them? Greg Garson all the time. Walter Pigeon? Walter Pigeon, he's Canadian. And, uh, and there are quite a few now. Uh, Last year you went on tour with uh, Arsenic and Old Lace? Yes. Uh, which brings me to, we might close on this, but the last year has uh, been the happiest year of my life, simply because I've had a chance to do long runs, one with my one-man show, Fools and Fiends, which I've been developing and mm -hmm. continue to develop. I'll be doing uh, Fools and Fiends now for the next three or four years, as long as there's a college campus that wants it. Meanwhile, I'll be getting another one ready for repeat performances. But meanwhile, I've had that. Also with Arsenic and Old Lace, it's the longest run in a major role I've ever had, which has been a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just closed two or three weeks ago in New Orleans. And, you know, I was still working on the roles as Jonathan Brewster. I was still working on them after a year. Uh, and that's why it's been my happiest year, because I, I realized that my whole career has been wrong from the very beginning. I should never have been in, in rep. Well, of course, that's good training. But um, stock and television uh, soaps, I was never happy doing it because I was never that sure of myself. Mm -hmm. I felt secure in the role, but I just did keep it up every day with these new lines. But with, I mean, I had the same lines for years, arsenic and arsenic, and the same lines with Fools and Fiends. But I've had them for a year or so, and um, they work. Now they really work for me. Now I'm very comfortable, and I enjoy. I really get involved instead of just winging it. So, Arsenic's been a great experience, and I've worked with a lot of good people in that too. It helped me in my comic sense because I was working with Gene Stapleton, and Marion Ross, and Gary Sandy. Gary Sandy is a brilliant comedian, and Larry Storch, of course, has been. Of course. Uh, he's been a stand-up comedian for all his life. He was, I think he was born in a trunk. I really do. <laughs> I, I've got one last question for you. I, it, it's, it seems rather strange and ironic that people keep harking back to something you did so many years ago, almost 20 years ago. How do you live with that? Are you just tolerate it now? Or, oh, I mean, no, as a matter of fact, I'm using it to the hilt right now. We're, we're, <laughs> we're changing our whole tactics on selling fools and fiends because simply because in, it's, it's, we're selling it as a campus as a, as a college tour, and we know that the students, for the most part, uh, don't remember that. They don't. They were not old. They weren't old enough to know it. And so we're putting out a new poster, and we're using a, a banner headline from last summer when I got a good review for Fools and Means: Vampire lures crowd, actor mesmerizes it. Well, vampires right at the top of this new poster. And then the next line is: Star of the legendary Dark Shadows. It's almost like a circus commercial. <laughs> uh, see him, hear him in his spellbinding one-man show, John Fulsby. So we're we're playing Barnabas to the hilt. I used to be very snooty about it, but then I, I can understand that though. I mean, I mean, if someone asks you, well, tell me about this episode that I didn't understand. What really went on behind the scenes? Oh well, yes. Well, that's better to have them ask something than nothing. Yeah. So, you know. but I mean, that's 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 history, and yet people. People still latch on to it. Oh, sure. I, I mentioned Why well, I, I always tease people to start asking me questions about the show. I said, go and ask somebody else that knows more about it than I do, like a fan or something. Because I don't, I don't remember. You talked about the last episode. I yeah. can't even remember what it was. I was so confounded by the, what was going on at that time. I didn't even know what we were up to in the last episode. Well, you also but you were a fan, you see, yes. and you were watching. You, I always think, by the way, act, act, the audiences sometimes do more acting than the actors. That's an Figure that one out. <laughs>